Mercury being so close to the sun that it would all be, always be very, very hot, right? Well, there's two things there that we, we might miss out on. One of them is that Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere. And so what we've got around us that helps to keep us warm when we're faced away from the sun is not there. And so when Mercury is facing away from the sun, it can get as cold as 200 degrees below zero when it's on the far side of the sun. And I think probably the slow rotation of Mercury also contributes to that. So I mean, you look at all of these things, and we recognize that would it would be impossible for human beings to live on the planet Mercury. The gases on Venus make it impossible for, for human life there. And so as we look at all of these things, we recognize that we are in the perfect place. God has made the perfect place for us to be able to live and to survive. And God took such great care in making this world for us, giving us a place where we can live. I thought about playing for you the, uh, and I'm going to forget the name of it now because I didn't write it in my name, Creation Calls, <clears throat> that video that I like. I don't know if you you remember it, but there's all kinds of, it, they, they collaborated with the BBC who had just this really neat documentary with all kinds of nature pictures. And then you've got Brian, I think it's Brian Dorkinson, I probably didn't pronounce his name right, but he's singing the song Creation Calls, and you've got all of these pictures. And I mean, it's just, it, it's breathtaking to see the world that God has created for us. And so we understand from this passage of scripture, from this parable, I think one of the messages that Jesus wants us to see about God is, because, is that God is so meticulous about the world that he's created for us. The second truth is that God cares enough to give several chances. God cares enough to give several chances. So God sends three servants. Or the, the, not God, but the, the landowner sends three servants. And the three servants, they're basically, I'm assuming that they're killed. Maybe the one that was beaten wasn't killed. But uh, they're not in very good shape. And what does the landowner do? Rather than calling out the mafia like I suggested, he sends more people. He gives them another chance. And then he gives them a third chance. And you know, I think it's probably indicative of the fact that, that uh, God gives extra chances. And we can see throughout the Old Testament where God would send prophets in and he'd say, here are the things that you are doing wrong. Here's what you need to do in order to correct it. From the book of Genesis to the book of Malachi. <laughs> I'm going to have to start writing my sermons out longhand, I think. <clears throat> I mean, all through the Old Testament, you've got all of these prophecies in which God is giving people another chance. And then we've got the 400 years of silence which are not really 400 years of silence. I think it's just because there wasn't any scripture that was given during that time from the end of Malachi to the beginning of the book of Matthew, or actually it'd probably be the book of Luke. But uh, as we look at this, God had given so many chances. And Israel was given chance after chance after chance to make things right for that nation and in their own lives. As you get to the end, Jesus begins talking. It almost seems like he's, he's shifting gears. In verse 42, if you never read the scriptures, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone, which was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. As I look at that passage and I think about second chances, I just imagine a mason uh, who's sitting there and he's doing his work. He's got his hammer. He's making uh, pieces of rock. He's kind of tossing off the, the pieces that aren't any good for him anymore. And uh, for me, and I think it's kind of, um, couldn't really get a, a, a clear picture of what the chief cornerstone was. Some people described it as the keystone, which is at the top of the ark, which helps me, I can understand that. So this is, that's what I'm using here. So you've got the mason, he's working on this ark, he's tossing the pieces, an arch, not arc, arch. Sorry about that. Just can't talk today. So you've got this arch, and you know, you've got all the pieces, and they're kind of building up, up, up. And then once you get to the top, you've got kind of this trapezoid shaped stone that fits in there, and it kind of locks everything together. 
or does it go like that? I can't remember right now. Anyway, it's a special song. <laughs> Not a very good day for me, is it? <laughs> You got this stone that fits at the top there. And where does he get this stone? Jesus kind of gives us the picture that he goes back through the scrap pile and he finds the one that had been thrown out that just fits in that place. And they call it the keystone because it's kind of the thing that locks everything together. And so there needs to be great care. Not only does it serve as an architectural detail for you to look at, but it's a significant part of the structure of what's going on there. And so, um, you know, that stone that had been tossed off on the scrap pile has been given a second chance. And when we mess up, we feel like we need a second chance. John Maxwell wrote a book several years ago called uh, Failing Forward. Not falling forward, but failing forward. The idea being that when you fail, you get up, you brush yourself off, you recognize that God has forgiven you, and you go on with your life. And so we, rather than just failing, we try to fail forward. We try to make sure that, that uh, we are not, um, wow, I got ahead of myself here. We're not just giving up at this point. The third truth is that God is not afraid of discipline. We need to understand that God will discipline us at times. So imagine if, if this whole scenario actually played out in the world. What would have happened today if the landowner would have sent his, his collection agents to go and, and collect the rent and they killed those people? And then the landowner sends more and they killed those people. I mean, there would be an investigation. There would be people that would be, um, there would be people that would be arrested. There would be trials. There would be all kinds of stuff that would be going on at that. And uh, there's not, uh, we need to understand that, that God is not afraid of discipline. And as he's talking about this keystone again, in verse 44 he says, whoever falls on this stone, which kind of gives you the idea maybe someone has tripped over it, they'll be broken. When I look at that, as I was looking at that, and it, there's a bit of a contrast here because he says you'll be broken, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. So the whole idea of our falling is a chance for us to correct ourselves. I don't look at it, our falling and being broken as something that's terminal. But when you look at the next part, but on whomever it falls, it will grind him to powder. That sounds terminal to me. That doesn't sound so good. And so when we stumble, we have a chance to recover. And that's where I meant to bring in the whole failing forward. That God gives us other chances in order to carry out the work uh, that we can be doing. And then the fourth truth is that God can take away what's misused. God can take away what's misused. When you look at the end of the parable, God is basically telling these religious leaders, I have given you several chances to make the corrections that you need to make. And now the son's here, and you've not accepted what he has to say either. And so he's going to take that away. Therefore I say, this is verse 43, Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it. <clears throat> God is taking away the thing that they have not been faithful with. The vine dressers were going to be punished. You know, sometimes we look at the things that, that we have in our life and maybe there are ministries that we have done. Maybe there are things that we've been involved in and it's gone away. And we're wondering, why did that happen? Maybe we taught a Sunday school class at some times, and, and now that Sunday school class isn't happening anymore. Or maybe we did a Bible study, and that Bible study, you know, it might be God saying you've not been faithful with that, so he's taken it away. That's not always the case. I don't want you to, to, to understand that I'm saying that that's always the case, but sometimes that might be it. Maybe it's just lived out its life. <clears throat> Sometimes the things that, that we're hanging on to are not the things that God is hanging on to. 
And I give you this today because I want to make sure that we have got a right perception of God. I hear so many people in our world today, and it just grieves my heart to hear people come up with, with wrong ideas about God because it makes them feel good. We need to be careful that we're not building our theology and our understanding of God on our feelings. We need to be building our understanding of God on His Word. He's shown us in His Word who He is and what He's about. And so that's where we need to go to gain our understanding of who God is and not base it on what we think, what we feel, what makes us feel good. I mean, there are some times when God says things, or Jesus says some things in Scripture that just don't make us feel good. Imagine that you're one of the religious leaders, and Jesus has said to you, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken from you and given to a nation bearing the fruit of it. And he talks about you being crushed to powder. Those are not happy messages. Because we need to understand that sometimes God's messages aren't happy messages for us. And those are probably the times that we need to be paying the most attention. You know, I got I, I, to be honest with you, I am fearful sometimes as I look at the world that we live in that we have become, not necessarily us here, but a lot of times in our society, the people that we live with the people that call themselves Christians in our world have become the religious leaders. Not really understanding what's going on in the world. Not really focusing on God, but focusing more on what makes them feel good. We need to be careful that we don't fall into that trap as well. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to thank you for your presence here with us today. And we thank you, Lord, for your love and for your mercy for us. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to have an accurate understanding of who you are. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us to clearly understand you uh, so that we're not delivering a false or a wrong message about you. And I pray, Lord, that we would hear clearly the message that you have for us. We ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, once again, the offering box is just outside there. We also, just as a reminder, we also have the online giving option, and uh, we still get checks in the mail, so that's an option as well. We have a closing hymn, maybe. <laughs> you guys going to be able to pull it together? Yeah, we'll see. We can't guarantee I'm smiling under here. I'll have a call in Jesus' name. I have to find the two. Do we got words on the thing? How many verses? <laughs> One, two, and four. Okay. I'll have the power of Jesus' name.